Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansi. Tonight, the plea to Quebecers from provincial health officials, keep your distance. We ask you a month of effort to break the second wave. The highest number of daily cases there since May, while Canada crosses a new threshold. Until you've actually lived it, you don't truly grasp it. As the CERB program ends, Canadians in need have to learn new rules. If you're a, a white-collar criminal and wanting to hide money, Canada is the place to go. Tracking a mysterious international case with ties to Alberta and New Brunswick. And how COVID-19 created a panda problem at the Calgary Zoo. I myself would like to see the pandas. Why these two visitors may be headed home early. This is The National. Canada has now crossed another COVID-19 plateau, 150,000 total cases. For a country at a crossroads, it means more pressure for everyday Canadians, for health officials, and for political leaders. Protecting people will continue to be job one as we move forward. And one of the best ways to do that is with a safe and effective vaccine. And so tonight we look at the latest on Canada's vaccine strategy, including major new acquisition deals and the government's financial support strategy as the CERB ends. We look at how hospitals are bracing for a potential onslaught and how provinces are preparing for a second wave while trying to resist a second lockdown. And let's start there in Quebec. Not just more new known cases than anywhere in Canada, but the province's highest one-day tally since May. Now, frustrated officials are telling people just how serious things are. Justin Hayward has that tonight. La situation demeure inquiétante. Quebec's health minister is worried. Worried by the constant rise in COVID cases and the private gatherings where it spreads. He's asking Quebecers to give up the partying for the next 28 days. And I insist on this. It is for a month. This is not permanent. We ask you a month of effort to break the second wave. That's asking a lot, especially this weekend when some unexpected summery weather will draw out the crowds. This McGill student won't be going anywhere. Fatigue, um, very pounding headaches. He's getting over COVID-19, self-isolating in his apartment, watching the cases rise. Over the past week and a half, we've seen um, like more and more positive cases come up in other friend groups. I would say in terms of people that I know right now in the Miguel Ghetto that are positive for COVID, I would say like 25, 30 that I know. The students say they were taken off guard by the quick spread of the virus. Others point to popular student bars near the university, still open for business. It's not just the big cities being asked to tone it down. A student party a month ago in La Pocatière, east of Quebec City, caused an outbreak that shut down this agricultural college. Now it has spread to family farms, like this one where six people have fallen ill, pushing the fall harvest back a month. Hope will eventually come in the form of a vaccine. Quebec is reaching out to medical professionals, from acupuncturists to physiotherapists, to train them on administering a potential vaccine. We need training, says the head of Quebec's order of dietitians, but we can do it. But for now, Quebecers are going to have to cancel the parties, even Thanksgiving, if they hope to see family over Christmas. Justin Hayward, CBC News, Montreal. And here's a look at Canada's COVID-19 situation by the numbers tonight. Western Canada continues its recent trend. 98 cases in B.C., 153 in Alberta. That's more than 100 a day for more than two weeks. And Manitoba's surge jumped to 54, but central Canada remains the biggest concern. Those 637 cases in Quebec and 409 in Ontario, numbers reminiscent of the spring. Ontario has been rolling out its fall COVID plan all week, including a new testing plan. Today it acknowledged some confusion over how that will work, but the province was crystal clear about its new restrictions. Magda Gabrasalasa has the details. Suited up and ready with the swab, Sunitha Condor's first COVID-19 test today was on a colleague. She says the phone has been ringing non-stop but not everyone is eligible. They need to be asymptomatic. They should not have been tested for COVID positive within the past 30 days. Testing is actually even more targeted than that. Residents, workers and visitors in long-term care homes get priority. 
as well as air travelers, those who work or stay in homeless shelters, and farm workers. You have to be pre-screened over the phone. Forget walking in. It's a bit frustrating. This is the second place I visited today. I think that there's a lot of misinformation. I myself tried calling and checking. Today, the government admitted there's been some confusion during the process, something they'll want to clear up as more than 400 new COVID cases were announced. We're seeing the cases jump literally in a two-week span. Ford announced new restrictions on bars, restaurants and clubs. Tonight, they close at 12 o'clock midnight. Tomorrow, they stop serving alcohol at 11 p.m. and close their doors at midnight. Strip clubs have been shut down immediately and all businesses have to screen customers before letting them in. Caroline Maines gets regularly screened. Her father's long-term care home requires a test every two weeks, she says. She was happy to do it in a pharmacy this time. This is much more convenient, especially with my elderly mom, because I don't have to line up with her. So just make an appointment and pop in, it was much easier. Ford said today that up to 18 additional pharmacies are set to do COVID testing as early as next week in many of the communities that were left out this week. Mark de Gebrasalasa, CBC News, Toronto. That spike in infections in Manitoba has prompted new restrictions. The Winnipeg metropolitan region uh, will move to the restricted level or orange uh, on the pandemic uh, response system effective Monday, September 28th. People going to bars and restaurants will be expected to wear a mask, except when seated at a table. Gatherings in the region will also be limited to 10 people. The new rules will be in place for at least four weeks. Action to reduce contacts and increase testing comes after a month of losing ground to the virus. The average daily number of new cases in Canada has roughly tripled in one month, but the number of those in hospital with the virus is increasing far more gradually and only really started to tick up a couple of weeks ago. One of the main threats from COVID-19 is that it can overwhelm hospitals. We are nowhere close to that right now, but as Christine Burak tells us, there's some nervous feelings on the front lines. As COVID cases rise, hospitalizations are starting to pick up speed in several provinces. These are worrying signs. We know how quickly the virus can spread. These surges in cases can overwhelm public health. Canada's first wave of severe COVID cases peaked in May, with over 3,000 Canadians lying in hospital beds. And we're not there yet but the trend is getting worse and worse and worse. Right now, 427 people are hospitalized with this coronavirus. Most of those patients are in Ontario, Quebec and BC. Instead of one big raging fire, it's dozens of small little fires that are all adding together. Including an outbreak inside this Calgary hospital. This week, 17 patients and nine staff members tested positive for COVID-19, and over 100 staff members are now in isolation. It's a scenario that scares ICU nurse Kamisha Marshall. She and her colleagues are preparing for the next wave of patients. My only concern is nurses. We have, that we have enough nurses, and they, don't, they themselves don't fall sick with COVID. According to recent statistics, nearly one in every five cases of COVID-19 in this country has been among healthcare workers. Twelve have died. Kevin, you got a real busy day. We're already the head of the country's largest hospital network says staff are currently treating patients who've had their surgeries put on hold by this pandemic. He fears time is running out. Which means we'll have to dramatically veer down our elective work yet again and worry about having adequate people in place to care for the critically ill. The rise in COVID cases is prompting some provinces to bring in new restrictions. Public health authorities insist it's not too late to flatten the curve. But in the event that it doesn't happen, hospitals are once again preparing for the worst. Christine Virak, CBC News, Toronto. When it comes to jobs and schools, the pandemic has turned many Canadians' lives upside down. Seven months on, two stories show there is still confusion. Let's start with a return to school. As Evan Dyer explains, Ontario's online in-school rollout has left parents and teachers frustrated. We are bubbling with my husband's in-law, uh, husband's uh, parents um, who have some things and are older. So we were like, okay, we're going to do virtual. Blair Irwin signed up her son for online school as soon as she could and received a confirmation. So I thought I was good to go. Penny! 
But then she started hearing there were problems, and now she's got one. Like, I still don't have a teacher for my kid. <laughs> No teacher, no class. Uh, all we have is we have a link to some um, asynchronous learning. Um, and I challenge anybody who has a five-year-old to try to get a five-year-old to do work. In Ottawa, one mother sent her child back to school in person and now regrets it. The first day of school, basically, he wasn't feeling well because he'd eaten something that didn't agree with his stomach. He couldn't go back without getting tested which meant waiting hours in a lineup. The writing was on the wall. I just thought this winter is going to be horrible. Yes, this rollout for virtual schools has been a dismal fail. Have a great day. Thank you. you too. Teachers Union says it won't be easy to get things back on track. We keep hearing that more and more teachers are needed to go virtual because the request for students going virtual has exceeded what was first anticipated. Today, the Ford government promised to deal with some of the issues that are plaguing the first days of school. We know that uh, many, many children have runny noses throughout the school year, but they're, uh, they're otherwise healthy. So we have referred the issue to the health measures table and to the chief medical officer of health to, uh, to look at redesigning or, or looking at the symptoms. Elliott says Ontario has hired more than 500 new school nurses to deal with that issue and the province is hiring more teachers, even trying to recall teachers who retired decades ago as it tries to run two parallel school systems, one bricks and mortar and the other online. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa. There's also confusion for some Canadians who've been relying on CERB payments. That program ends Sunday and while most recipients will transfer to EI, it's not that easy for everyone. Jacqueline Hansen explains. Sarah Pacey was on maternity leave when she lost her job as a behavior therapist last December. Then the pandemic hit and she couldn't find a new job when her mat leave ended. So she turned to CERB. I was hoping that before CERB ran out there, I'd have some sort of indication about what my livelihood and my financial future might look like. But she doesn't, and she's worried she doesn't qualify for any of the new CERB replacements. It was a little disheartening to hear the Prime Minister say nobody will f be forgotten, but because of your very kind of unique and individualized situation, you kind of don't fall anywhere. More than 2 million CERB recipients are expected to transfer to EI, some automatically, some not. The Liberals have also proposed three new programs aimed at covering people who wouldn't qualify for EI, people who have to care for others or get sick themselves. But this economist estimates at least 400,000 people who were getting CERB now won't qualify for anything. It's still going to be complicated for a lot of people. Plus, the bill for the proposed support programs hasn't been passed yet. It's still, I don't think, going to be clear. It's going to be a messy process. Life has been messy for Roger Weeb and his wife. They both lost their jobs. Work slowed down at his warehouse and at her legal office. I've put out, I think, about 100 resumes. CERB has helped, but their expenses have gone up without workplace benefits to help cover medications. I think I've got about 27 dollars, maybe a little bit more if I add up my change. They hope to both qualify for one of the CERB replacements, but even still, it'll be a struggle. They, they talk about it, about the hardships and how they understand it, but until you've actually lived it, you don't truly grasp it. Any delay or disruption to the new support programs could make their difficult situation even worse. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. When a safe, effective vaccine is ready to go, Canada wants to be in line. The question is, which line? There are dozens of vaccines in development, so the answer is as many lines as possible. David Cochran explains the government has now agreed to get six different vaccines. None of the vaccines being developed are ready for use, but Canada is getting prepared for when they are. We've reached an agreement with AstraZeneca for the vaccine they are developing with the University of Oxford. This agreement secures up to 20 million doses for Canadians. Canada now has deals to secure up to 282 million doses of the six leading vaccine candidates, ensuring a supply once a vaccine gets the green light, stockpiling options for a way out of a pandemic that is getting worse by the day.
An average of 1,175 cases have been reported daily across Canada during the most recent seven days. We are continuing to see an increase in daily case counts nationally. The focus is on the crisis at home, but Canada is also spending big to help others, giving $440 million to a global procurement initiative to get vaccine doses for Canadians and to send millions of doses to low-income countries. A message of cooperation Trudeau later delivered remotely to the United Nations. Let's use our shared power not just to get a vaccine, but to get it out to everyone. None of this means vaccine doses are on the way. They still need to pass clinical trials and get regulatory approval. These deals guarantee a spot in the line so that once a vaccine is ready, Canada can get its share. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Whatever chance there was of an election right after the Liberal throne speech appears to be gone. The NDP announcing it will support the minority government in return for concessions. Today is a historic moment where we have in the first time ever in this country's history, established a federal paid sick leave. The NDP leader said the deal will widen access to paid sick leave to millions of Canadians during the pandemic. The deal also ensured that workers who have had the impact uh, that they get the same money they received under CERB. It all goes into a bill up for debate early next week. Two other federal party leaders are currently in isolation with the virus. Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole and the bloc leader Yves-Francois Blanchet. Catherine Cullen looks at their cases and the challenges for politicians during a pandemic. The situation facing my family shows that we must remain extremely vigilant in our battle against the spread of COVID-19. Aaron O'Toole has been calling for caution after getting COVID. But social media images from before he and his staffer were tested show O'Toole and his team met with dozens of people in a single day. A source tells CBC News there are approximately 15 cases of COVID connected to this trip, including O'Toole, his wife and two staff members. Though O'Toole's team won't confirm a number, saying, because some people who contract COVID-19 do not exhibit symptoms, it would be irresponsible to speculate on the number of people who may have become infected. The source says many of the cases are linked to events O'Toole held one morning with conservative organizers and candidates. Anne Francis was at one. While she removed her mask for a photo, she says COVID precautions were taken. You can actually see my mask in my hand in the picture, and then I put the mask uh, right back on. Conservatives say all their events followed public health guidelines and that it all happened before the second wave was declared. <laughs> As for bloc leader Yves-Francois Blanchet, who went to Saint-Hyacinthe, a three-day trip to the Abitibi region and Montreal before learning he could have been exposed to COVID, the bloc said in a statement, all of his activities before his diagnosis were analyzed by public health, which determined that no one was put at risk during his travels. Adding the party rigorously respects health guidelines. The photos themselves aren't particularly egregious, says one epidemiologist, but prompt questions about politics during a pandemic. I think we expect our politicians to be visible. We might have to put those expectations on hold in the current climate because we don't want people interacting with a bunch of different groups. O'Toole himself said just this week that it is up to MPs to practice the highest standards and not inadvertently expose anyone to COVID. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. After months of uncertainty, a pair of giant pandas in Alberta could soon be on the move. The pandemic made caring for them here in Canada nearly impossible. Now it's hampering their journey home to China. Aaron Collins has the details. At Calgary Zoo, it's no secret what the big draw is. Pandas are so cute and are very like, uh, all the kids like the pandas. Two pandas have been living here since 2018 on loan from China after a stint at Toronto Zoo. Well, since then, the pair have packed in the crowds and devoured more than 6,000 tons of bamboo along the way. That's 40 kilos a day per panda, all sourced from China. Well, it's a lot of bamboo, and when COVID-19 hit, the shipments dried up. So now the zoo is forced to send the pandas home three years earlier than planned. But in the midst of a global pandemic, shipping pandas across the planet well, it's easier said than done. You need to have bookings well in advance you need to make sure that the aircraft has a space. There will have to be at least one handler, maybe two who come from China. 
There'd have to be bamboo on board. For now, the pandas will stay put but won't be on display, hoping to hitch a ride back to China in a couple of weeks, leaving some disappointed fans here in Canada. We didn't get to go see the pandas, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we bought a panda. <laughs> a little bit disappointing maybe, I guess. It was a little, because I myself would like to see the pandas. The Calgary Zoo says they have enough food to last until the pandas fly home to China, where bamboo is abundant. Their time in Canada cut short, but they will always have a special place here. In my bed, because I'm going to cuddle it. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. One more pandemic note tonight. The week ended with another milestone in the United States where cases topped 7 million. The U.S. is now accounting for more than 20 percent of the world's total reported infections. The country also has about a fifth of the nearly 1 million deaths worldwide. And we have an update on a Burlington, Ontario man who claimed to be an ISIS fighter and said he took part in executions. Well, it turns out he's now alleged that uh, to have lied about it all and has been charged with perpetrating a terrorist hoax. There was also uh, beheadings too. News outlets, including the CBC, agreed to protect Shiroz Chaudhry's identity for interviews where he detailed lurid crimes. Those made international headlines and caused an uproar in Parliament. But police say Chaudhry, who called himself Abu Huzaifa al Kanadi, made up the stories of his ISIS exploits. The charge carries a punishment of up to five years in prison. Young climate activists around the world resume their weekly protest today for the first time since the pandemic began. When Mother Earth is under attack! Up next, we'll take you to the Fridays for Future protests in this country. Plus, doctors on call to answer your questions. We're seeing cases in young adults spike. What you need to know about the cohort catching COVID-19 and a uniquely personal tribute to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We're back in two. We need to treat the climate crisis as a crisis. It's just as simple as that. The climate crisis Greta Thunberg and the Fridays for Future are back. The climate activists joined fellow demonstrators outside the Swedish parliament today, and there were protests across the world. And I'm here today because I'm fed up with the Australian government's inaction on the climate crisis. We need to act now before it's too late. This one, smaller and socially distanced, was from the Arctic Circle. I'm here to bear witness to the sea ice minimum and how our leaders have to make a decision now in order to save it. And the issue was also part of the Prime Minister's address today to the UN General Assembly. Our world is facing a climate reckoning. On this global day of climate action, advocates in this country were also speaking out and looking at how the issue is addressed in Wednesday's throne speech. As Tashana Reed explains, they hope the promises are followed by policy. When Mother Earth is under attack, what do we do? Instead of a march, masked climate activists sit on a road six feet apart. Still, the message and the passion remains. Um, telling the government that we cannot go back to pre-COVID uh, business as usual. The pandemic has slowed some progress on climate change initiatives. The Earth's health is our own health. It's also the foundation for our existence. We can't separate those two anymore. Advocates like Dr. Tony Sapong says climate change needs to be seen as a critical health issue like COVID-19. It's really important when we look at recovering from both of these that we have an, a focus on human health, but also on the health of our ecosystem. In Wednesday's throne speech, a promise from the Liberal government that economic recovery would be tied to climate change policy. Climate action will be a cornerstone of our plan to support and create a million jobs across the country. Though details were scarce, it's a step in the right direction, says Lisa Gu, a senior policy analyst. It's increasingly clear that environmental recovery and economic recovery need to go hand in hand. The speech also included proposals for zero emissions vehicles, home retrofits and a promise to exceed current emissions reduction targets. Also, a plan to update the Environmental Protection Act and investments in clean energy. It will be really important 
uh, to set clear criteria for projects to ensure that we're optimizing emission reductions. The question is how to get there. We want to see a clear plan for getting to zero emissions by 2040, not 2050, as was outlined in the throne speech. Meanwhile, these climate activists say they'll continue to raise awareness and press the government for a green and just recovery. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. In the United States today, Breonna Taylor's family called for transparency in the legal proceedings related to her death. If you want us to accept the results, then release the transcript. The 26-year-old was killed by police in March, but no officer has been charged for it. One faces charges for firing into a neighboring apartment. Another history-making moment for the late U.S. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg today. She became the first woman and the first Jewish person to lie in state on Capitol Hill. Politicians and friends paid respects, along with a special tribute from her trainer, dropping to the ground, giving three perfect push-ups. He had trained Ginsburg since 1999, leading her now famous workouts. Next on The National, the doctors are in, answering your questions about COVID-19 and young people. Can you tell us just how accurate or wrong is the idea that young people are less likely to catch COVID? That and more right after this. I've stayed kind of just like in my social bubble of like work friends. I was getting kicked out of here. I'd be grabbing a group of buddies and going back to my place. Now since the cases are rising up again, like I'm sort of a little scared again. There's a saying, age is nothing but a number, though in a pandemic, how old you are could increase the chances of getting more severe symptoms. And that is putting pressure on younger adults. Cases are rising quickly in young people. 65% of the new cases reported in Ontario today were in people under the age of 40. With health officials concerned about the spread of COVID to older people, Dr. Teresa Tam made a special call out this week to young adults. This is your generation. This is your time. You've got this. All right, joining us now to answer some of your questions, Dr. Susie Hoda, an infectious disease specialist, and Dr. Samir Gupta, a respirologist. And uh, we have some questions via video. And the first one to you, Dr. Gupta, uh, listen to this. Can you tell us just how accurate or wrong is the idea that young people are less likely to catch COVID? And if they do, is it usually a less severe case? Well, it's really hard to know about susceptibility in different demographic groups, uh, largely because they have different exposure patterns. Uh, there were some data from China early on in the pandemic that suggested that young people may be less likely to catch this virus but it may also have been influenced by the fact that they uh, often have asymptomatic disease, so we may have been missing cases. Um, but it is true that they are less likely to get sick from this virus, so they're less likely to get symptoms. Uh, they seem to have less severe symptoms, and we know that they're less likely to be hospitalized and they're less likely to die from the virus. All right, next question to Dr. Hoda, a viewer writing in, is it possible the COVID-19 virus is mutating into a version that is more prone to attack young people, the 20 to 40 year olds? Well, I guess I'll start first with uh, the, the whole concept of mutation of viruses. So we know that viruses mutate and they do that. And most of the time it results in nothing that's of any significance. Um, the good news is the virus that causes COVID-19 infection doesn't appear to be rapidly mutating and not in any way that has really um, shifted its ability to infect people more easily or cause more severe illness um, or kind of shifted away from uh, significantly from what it initially was um, that it might actually compromise vaccine development. Um, so I haven't seen anything out there that suggests that it's mutated in a way that is targeting younger people more than older people. Um, but, you know, the point is that scientists are going to continue to monitor those kinds of changes. Yeah, but you know what? What we do know to this point, as you describe it, is a little comforting because a huge, significant mutation by COVID-19 right now, I don't think we're mentally kind of prepared for that. Uh, Dr. Gupta, here's a video question from Dylan Labonte. We're seeing cases in young adults spike. And a lot of people seem to blame this on younger people gathering despite public health advice. Conversely, this generation also has a large majority working in entry-level front-facing service jobs. 
Does this not inherently put them at more risk? Put simply, is there any scientific data that can explain why cases in young adults are spiking? This is a really important point being made, and there's a sort of narrative around young people being irresponsible and selfish and partying, uh, but there are many other reasons why we're seeing an increase in case, particularly in this younger demographic. Um, and, and the points that were made are very accurate. In fact, when we started opening up, it was young people in our service and retail industries that had to go back to work. Uh, so they were more likely to be exposed, and they don't necessarily have the luxury. They don't work the kinds of jobs that you can work from home as much, um, and they don't necessarily have the savings to ride out a pandemic like this. The other factor is that young people are much li more likely to be cohabitating. So they might be in, for example, a dorm uh, where they're going to have more exposure. So there's a lot more to this story, and there are many other reasons, including more exposures, that they're having in their jobs and their day-to-day -day lives outside of this narrative around partying and going to bars, et cetera. Yeah, really, really interesting answer. Uh, Dr. Hoda, next to you, uh, and it's another viewer video question. Hi, I have two daughters who are at different universities. Each of them live with four or five other girls. As hard as it is for this age group, they are all doing their best to keep within the advised social distancing protocols. Keeping in mind the numbers are going up in the 20s age group demographic, my question is, what is the recommended advice for testing university students who have maybe widened their social circle and should they be tested before coming home? Well, I'm really glad to hear that your daughters are trying their best to do the physical distancing and you know, masking and other public health and infection control measures because really those are the most important things for them to be doing. Testing's a bit challenging. Uh, right now, most areas of Canada are trying to reserve testing uh, for people who are symptomatic or have been you know, clearly exposed or at high risk because of the kind of occupation they, they have or the kinds of things that they, they do in their day-to-day -day life. And university students might fall within that group. Um, but the challenge was using testing to decide what you do, like should you uh, go home, are you safe to go home, is that it really just gives you a depiction of what's happening at that point in time. So an individual could be incubating a virus, test negative, feel reassured by that, and then come home and visit, but then go on to develop symptoms and potentially infect others. So again, it comes back to doing your absolute best to keep the physical distancing, mask, clean your hands, and follow the directions of public health that will keep everyone safe. All right. Dr. Hoda, Dr. Gupta, we really appreciate the time you're taking with us. Thank you. And next on The National, CBC News investigates shady financial transactions involving Canadian companies. I immediately thought of fraud. We follow the money right after this. Welcome back. A leak of secret U.S. financial documents points to potential money laundering involving Canadian companies. The files obtained by the website BuzzFeed and the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists show considerable suspicious activity. Working with colleagues from Radio Canada, CBC's Terence McKenna follows the trail tonight. In July 2019, off the coast of the West African country of Mauritania, an old Soviet-era fishing trawler called the Ivan Golubets suddenly caught fire. The Ukrainian crew scrambled to put out the flames. One young father of two, 39-year-old Oleg Nikulescu, rushed to the engine room to find the source of the fire. He was never seen again. The fire burned on for almost two days. Another Ukrainian crewed ship arrived to rescue the crew and tow the burning ship to safety. In the middle of the night, while it was being towed, the burning ship sank. The young father's body was never recovered. Back in Ukraine, his young widow Anna was astounded by the turn of events. A search of fishing records shows that the ship was operated by a Canadian company, Avil Business of Calgary, Alberta. 
The Evial Business website shows photos of their ships operating off the coast of Mauritania, a long menu of fish they can provide, and an address on 32nd Avenue in Calgary. But all that is at that address is a small shopping center with a sex shop and cannabis store, and a mail forwarding service which many companies use as a business address. We decided to investigate the history of the burning ship, the Ivan Golubets. What was it doing off the coast of Africa? The Golubets is one of a fleet of associated fishing trawlers working in the area. Turns out the ships had a record of infractions against international shipping regulations. They had been convicted of fishing illegally. We checked electronic records that tracked the ship's movements in the weeks before the fire. And there we found very suspicious patterns and several periods where they had illegally shut off their transponders, an unsafe practice that made them invisible to authorities for hours at a time. We consulted Dehia Belhabib of Vancouver, an internationally renowned authority on fishing practices to interpret the data. Like they're shutting down their uh, satellite signal, their AIS, uh, to hide something shady. They were very close, some of them even inside the actual zone where they were not supposed to be, which is completely illegal. We then discovered an even more suspicious detail. Evil Business of Canada had taken out a $15 million insurance policy on the ship with a Russian insurance company that went into effect only six hours before it mysteriously caught fire. The ship was actually worth much less than that. Immediately when you said that the insurance policy uh, was effective or was um, effective one the same day that the vessel has sunk, I immediately thought of fraud. A key element of the story comes from the secret financial documents leaked from FinCEN, the office of the U.S. Treasury Department that tracks suspect financial transactions around the world. Many suspicious activity reports traced millions of dollars being paid to the Canadian company Evil of Calgary, Alberta, that moved from a bank in Geneva, Switzerland, through various American and foreign banks in the U.S., before ending up at the Spare Bank in Moscow, Russia. It looked like the true owners of Evil of Calgary were likely Russians. The bank reports are not necessarily evidence of criminal conduct, and banks are not required to shut down accounts involved in suspected money laundering. In these documents, we also found very similar multi-million dollar transactions, often on the same day using the same banks, to another Canadian shell company called Oceanic Fisheries of St. John, New Brunswick. It tells me that the owner of these both companies, these, these vessels, is basically the same person or are basically the same and unique person. So it's somebody who is in Russia, probably. It is someone who has maybe various bank accounts, but it is definitely the same person. Once again, our team found no trace of actual company operations in New Brunswick, just a corporate services and mail forwarding office. Honestly, we really don't know much about the actual companies or what they do or anything like that. This Russian website extols the virtues of setting up shell companies in New Brunswick. No Canadian director required. No ownership information disclosed. Best of all, non-problematic export to Russia or Ukraine. It looks like a method of evading sanctions against Russia. New Brunswick opposition MLA Kevin Arsenault thinks his province has to change its rules to help stop international money laundering. If a Russian laundromat is using our public registry, it shouldn't be tolerated at all. This is, this is our reputation, this is, this is our hard work, our environment. This is the story of Toronto and Canada. I mean, For years, NDP MP Charlie people, Angus has been pressing Canadian governments to tighten up regulations to stop international money laundering, to no avail. Canada, you know, on one level we see ourselves as the world's Boy Scouts and we're so super clean. But if you're a, a white-collar criminal wanting to hide money, Canada is the place to go. We don't seem to think it's a problem, which makes us an easy mark, which makes it possible for international criminal money to come here and get cleaned. 
59 Ukrainian crew members of the Ivan Golubets were saved in the fire and sinking. Anna Nikolescu's husband, Oleg, was the only victim, and she doesn't know where to turn for fair compensation. For years, both liberal and conservative governments in Ottawa and the provinces have pledged to crack down on money laundering. So far, there is little in the way of action. Terence McKenna, CBC News, Toronto. Next on The National, the Toronto Blue Jays are on an unlikely playoff run. How they got here right after this. That's a pretty good shot right there. They're home in Buffalo. And they made the best of it. I mean, a year unlike any other, the Toronto Blue Jays do have reason to celebrate as they quietly put together a winning record. There has been a lot of change for the Jays this year, the shortened season, of course. No fans in the stands and no real place to call home. It's why many didn't expect them to be where they are now, a full-fledged playoff team. Jamie Strachan takes a look. On the way, swing and a miss. He got it. Rafael Luis finishes it off, and the Blue Jays are headed to the postseason. This is a good news sports story about a team nobody expected much from including the fans. I want them to know that we're thinking of them right now, you know, because this victory is for, for, for the city of Toronto and Canada. This isn't a team of high-priced superstars, but one driven by its core of young players. Awesome. One Thank of my you. boys here. <laughs> Woo! We did it! As the baseball cliche goes, every part of this roster contributed. They really believe in themselves maybe more than anybody else. Caitlin McGrath covers the team for The Athletic. Nobody else outside probably thought they were going to be a playoff team and they did it and, and they did it working together, working as a team. The Blue Jays were the only team in baseball who didn't have a home to begin the season. The Canadian government said they couldn't play here at the Rogers Centre, meaning they had to play their first 13 games on the road. They finally landed in Buffalo in the stadium their AAA team calls home. We could have easily looked at it in a negative way, and, and uh, but, you know, we, we didn't. We, we, we took it with a little bit of a chip on our shoulder, and we, we, uh, you know, we played with a little bit of an edge. The Yankee left. That edge has them back in the playoffs for the first time in four years. They are an exciting young team, and um, they've surprised some people so far, and maybe they can keep doing that. The Jays will likely open the playoffs in Tampa next Tuesday. Underdogs, of course. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. When we come back, the J-Pod of Orcas off the coast of BC has welcomed another calf. And we hear from two women who watched it all happen. There's National Geographic photographers and researchers that spend their entire lives looking to see something like this. They're one in a million story right after this. All right, that tiny fin on the left, a brand new orca calf, the newest addition to the J-Pod off the coast of British Columbia. The birth was witnessed by two women who got to experience this once in a lifetime moment. And so it's our moment tonight. We set out on our normal scheduled tour. One of our guests uh, shouted out, there's a killer whale. He noticed after a while, um, it, it had been staying quite close to the surface and for a few minutes and then it went under for about five to seven minutes and then when it popped up again it had this little um little blob with it yeah. she looks at me and she goes are you are you seeing the black thing with the whale and i was like i think so we got thinking well maybe it's entangled it could be dragging some sort of gear that moment it kind of shifted from being it could be a whale in danger who it is a mom and now a cat <laughs> Oh, oh. oh my gosh, this is now a baby and this baby wasn't here before. The baby popped up by itself next to mom and just bounced along with her. The connection of having a baby yeah. born and especially around us is it's like our baby. <laughs> <laughs>
They are naturalists who describe themselves as fairly inexperienced in, in that kind of line of work. Um, and so they totally understand that there are, for example, photographers and other naturalists who will devote their lives to trying to catch that moment and never see it. And they already have, and they certainly appreciate it. That is the National for Friday, September 25th. I hope you join me on Sunday for Cross Country Checkup on CBC Radio and back here on Sunday night.